Up next on Eco Company. Marine creatures revealed checking the shoreline at low tide. Actually, you can see it actually attaching to me right now. Whoa. These teens are exploring tide pools and getting a lesson on a delicate ecosystem. Then, going bird watching. But these aren't just any birds. Five feet tall, seven foot wingspan. It's the sandhill crane, and they've been around for over 40 million years. Plus, developing a new wonder nut could this be the new source for biofuel? We really believe that this will affect the world in a positive way. Making a hybrid hazelnut as a crop of the future. And you'll see a student video from the Planet Connect Teen Video Contest. All that and more coming up on Eco Company. Starting right now. Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to Eco Company. I'm Josh. And I'm Jordan, and it's a great day to get outside, take in some fresh air, and enjoy nature. Most of us, me included, don't do that nearly enough. But you're missing out if you don't. There's so much to explore and learn. And recently, Jordan did just that, heading down to the shoreline to see what she could find. Hey guys, tide pools like these found along the California coast reveal unique ocean ecosystems. We're here to explore them and see what we can find. Where can you go to find creatures of all shapes, makes, and sizes right at your fingertips? Ah! Why, a tide pool, of course. Puddles created when ocean tides recede along the shoreline. An intertidal zone, this is a zone where it's a rocky area where the tide, which is caused by the moon, um, will go high and low twice a day. And when it's a low tide, the rocks are exposed leaving pools of water where organisms can live. Haley Usedom is the education coordinator at the nonprofit Marine Science Institute in Northern California. We are trying to cultivate responsibility for the natural environment and, and human communities through education, science education. Today she's hosting an expedition for high school students from Palo Alto's Castileta School. Waterproof boots are a must. It's not completely low tide quite yet, so we're going to try to go out as far as we can and keep going out until we have to come back. On this journey, it's important to keep your eyes peeled. Did everyone see the purple urchin? Not just on the rocky ground, but also on the water. And it's strictly hands-on, everything we do. So here at the Typhoon Expedition, what we do is we go and we explore what animals live here, how they're able to adapt to the tide changes, and what's happening with them. Explorers like Sarah Fellerman and Lauren Rance aren't afraid to get up close and personal with sea critters. Not to disturb, but to learn. First we learned about the tides and the rack lines, which is how far the tides actually go out and in. And then we um, examined different marine life in the tide pools. We looked at hermit crabs, sea anemones, uh, starfish as well. Um, we were on the search for a sea cucumber. We didn't exactly find one. What did they find a lot of? These little critters. This one is the porcelain crab. Its flattened body allows it to live in rock crevices. This is a kelp crab. Now kelp crabs are spiky. They're not gonna pinch, but their legs are a little bit spiky because they use it to hold on. Fish come to the party too. One in particular. And you're gonna try to catch it when this fish well. is the sculpin, and it's pretty unique. It's a fish that actually can live for three days out of water, and they can get about this big. We found one was about that big, so um, we caught it and um, we examined it for a little bit as well. It's safe to say that out here, not everything is what it seems. Now, this may not look like it's alive, but wait till you see what happens when I touch it. Ah! All of these sea creatures are important to the ecosystem, the food chain, and climate studies. Here in the tide pools, we have a huge biodiversity, which is one of the biggest reasons why tide pools are so important. You also have a lot of indicator species that actually show when there is a change going on in the environment that they're infected first. One of those key indicator species is the starfish. It helps control muscle populations. But actually, you can see it actually attaching to me right now. Whoa! Whoa! Some of the sea stars, like the ochre star that we saw today, they're actually able, they like to eat mussels, and they'll take their tube feet, pull the mussels apart, and then stick their stomach inside the mussel shells to feed. But mussels have more than starfish to be afraid of. 
They also face a growing threat caused by climate change. Mussels and oysters and clams, that ocean acidification is actually causing their shells to be weaker and thinner, which of course it makes it a hard time to be able to survive, especially in the tide pool area where you're having crashing waves coming all the time and other predators like birds that are feeding on them. Tidal zones also face threats from sea level rise. Um, what's happening is the organisms live at certain zones. And because the sea, sea level is rising, they migrate higher up into the zones. And it's causing the shift of change that way. These are all concerns for Usdom, who hopes to inspire the younger generation to respect the ocean and marine life. Well, I hope that they take away what they've learned about the animals and how they're able to survive. I learned a lot about marine life and that diversity especially. Um, there's many different types of fish. It was really fun. I saw lots of things. I learned that mussels make thread that's actually stronger than steel. And I didn't know that, and they use it for stitches. So now you too know some of the secrets held inside these pools of water. A delicate ecosystem at the mercy of the tides, and us too. This is a habitat where things can change based on how humans interact in it. They are some of the ocean's mysteries that we hold literally in the palm of our hand. Coming up, more of nature's spectacular creatures. We're talking birds. And these beautiful creatures have been affected by the loss of habitats. We've lost somewhere in the range of 90 to 95% of all the wetland habitat. What this preserve is doing to change all that. Then creating a new hybrid crop. We visit Arbor Day Farms to find out about their new wonder nut. We have a program where we're trying to make hazelnut so that they will grow around the world. Could this be the crop of the future? More Eco Company after these messages. If you can't get to some place as exciting as a seaside tide pool, just visit a local hiking trail. It's great exercise and there's always something new to see. Of course, there's also habitats everywhere that are preserved for nature. The preserve in this next story gets some special visitors every year, and it's quite a sight to see. <laughs> They're gorgeous, graceful creatures that don't so much fly as they do dance. It can be up to five feet tall, seven foot wingspan, in large numbers dancing, making all this sound. It's, it's really fantastic. These winged marvels are sandhill cranes, the most abundant crane species in the world. And the Nature Conservancy's Jesse Roseman says perhaps also the oldest. We found fossils from 40 million years ago. Same bird, so it's really a living fossil. In central California, the best place to spot them is at the Cosumnes River Preserve, where they fly south for the winter. Several of our banded cranes have been coming back here for many years. I believe there was a pair which was nicknamed Sweetie and Softy. It's a migratory bird, so it only spends part of the season down here at the Cosumnes, basically getting fat. Uh, then it'll go back to the north if it's a greater sandhill crane, which is a threatened species here in California. Then it'll go only as far as Oregon. Hunters nearly wiped out the greater sandhill crane in the 18th and 19th century. Preserve manager Harry McQuillan, who's with the U.S. Bureau of Land Management, says urbanization has also taken its toll. They were listed for the exact same reasons as almost every other species is listed on the endangered species list, whether it's the Federal Endangered Species Act or the State Endangered Species Act, and it's due to habitat loss and fragmentation. We've lost somewhere in the range of 90 to 95 percent of all the wetland habitat that a lot of these cranes used to depend on. I think that's really affected their overall numbers. There are still other spots in the, throughout their range where they can be hunted. But that's not the case here, thanks to restoration efforts. And our primary purpose for being here basically focuses on three different types of habitat, freshwater wetlands, valley oak riparian forest, and then uh, annual grasslands, vernal pool grasslands. Those are our three dominant habitat types that we work on. It's a task that's far from a solo effort. It takes several government agencies, nonprofit groups, as well as private landowners. It really does take a team 
of folks out here to get the job done. Government agencies manage the land and work with local farmers and ranchers who also play a big role. Biologist Carlene Volherbst is with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We work with um, Private landowners and here at the preserve, we're looking at neighbors of the preserve, uh, partners within the Cosumnes River watershed uh, to help them do restoration on their private land. Farmers also help the wildlife ecosystem by growing certain crops. When we harvest a field, we'll make sure that some of the grain is left on the surface so they can come in behind our harvesting. And then we also add water to the fields, which is another critical element for the cranes. And then they're able to gather their food and roost. It's all part of a plan to protect not just the Sandhill Crane, but everything else around them too. In fact, there are more than 260 animal species taking refuge here. If we protect habitat for the Sandhill Crane and can get people excited about cranes, we then surreptitiously protect habitat for lots of other species. That's where educating the public comes in. To that end, 10,000 school kids visit the preserve each year. Our theory is uh, give them some hands-on. You know, you can read it in a book. I could read in a book how to, you know, build a rocket, but that doesn't mean I could actually do it on the ground. And so we have kids that come out here and they'll collect acorns in September, October, and then they'll come back in December, January, February and plant them for us. So they actually get to see the whole process. It's a job that's not so much a job, but a mission for these nature lovers. Part of my job is being able to spend time outside, being able to create habitat for wildlife, uh, and be able to share that with the public, to be able to share uh, how amazing wildlife is, the wonders of wildlife, and, and getting to, to share that with the public. Well, the best part of my job is basically showing up every morning and you see these huge flocks of birds flying overhead and knowing that I played a role in helping to provide that home for that animal or that plant is really very satisfying. It's a spectacular place to be. <laughs> I can't imagine going anyplace else right now. A spectacular place where birds dance on the horizon. An unforgettable sight for those lucky enough to witness the sandhill cranes take flight. Up next, we head to Nebraska to visit Arbor Day Farms. Researchers here believe they're creating something special. You know, we really believe that this will affect the world in a positive way. A new wonder nut that could be a source for biofuel. More Eco Company is coming up. Up next, we visit a place that's nothing short of a nature paradise. It's Nebraska's Arbor Day Farm where they celebrate trees and the bounty they provide. But there's more going on here than meets the eye. Anna paid them a visit to find out more. I'm in Nebraska City, Nebraska, home to the Arbor Day Farm. And this is the home of Jay Sterling Morton, the founder of Arbor Day. This national historical park is inspiring people to celebrate trees and a whole lot more. From tree adventures to orchards and colorful leaves every which direction. If you want to learn about trees, you've come to the right place. The Arbor Day Farm is part of the legacy left behind by Jay Sterling Morton. He was U.S. Secretary of Agriculture under President Grover Cleveland, and he founded Arbor Day in 1872. This was all the original working farm, cattle, trees, all that stuff of Jay Sterling Morton's original farm and rancher. Nothing short of nature's paradise, everything here has a purpose and that's to inspire people to celebrate, nurture, and plant trees. Plus, there's something else going on here too. Did I mention the hazelnut project? That's what's going on inside this greenhouse. Let's go inside and take a look. These aren't leafy greens you're looking at. They're hazelnut seedlings, and this greenhouse is full of them. Well, as you can see, you're surrounded by hazelnuts. These are ones that we've actually harvested out on the field. It's a wonder nut that Arbor Day Farm VP Doug Farrar says could be coming into its own with a little help. We have a program where we're trying to make hazelnuts so that they will grow around the world, fundamentally. By we, he means the Hybrid Hazelnut Consortium. It's the Arbor Day Foundation and a group of institutions hoping to unleash the hazelnut's full potential. 
not just as a food crop, but also as a biofuel. You know, we really believe that this will affect the world in a positive way. Okay, before we go any further, why do they think the hazelnut is so great? Well, it produces more oil per acre than soybeans used for biodiesel. It doesn't need much water. And its shrub is dense, so it's great for protecting habitats. Plus, plant the crop once and you can pretty much call it a day. Nebraska's Chief Forester Scott Josiah couldn't be more excited about all the above. To be able to grow a biofuel, a biodiesel, at twice the rate that we can with soybeans on a perennial crop where we're not disturbing the ground every year and do that on lands that are not growing food right now. That's exciting. Now for the challenge, growing them commercially in the Midwest or even the United States. Arbor Day Farms' Adam Howard gives us the stats. 97% of the hazelnuts are grown outside of the U.S. We have a 3% market share in the states, and that 3% market share is only in the state of Oregon currently. The problem is that while the European nut is a larger, high-quality nut, it's picky about where it lives and not too disease-resistant. Their American version is the opposite. European in my right hand, American in my left, much smaller, not commercial at all, but this is resistant to what's called Eastern filbert blight, a, a deadly disease which just kills this. The solution, according to the University of Nebraska researchers at the Arbor Day Farm, plus the consortium partners Rutgers and Oregon State, is to combine the two. We want to find hazel, hybrid hazelnuts. That's a mix of kind of two kinds of hazelnuts, to not get too scientific. We find the best one with the best nuts, the best one that grows in the best region. Put those two together, that's the ma and the pa, and see what the kids are. <laughs> The perfect kid will be disease and cold resistant, thrive almost anywhere, and become a competitive crop. You'll see cornfields and soybeans being replaced by hazelnuts. You plant them once and they grow for 25 years. These hybrid shrubs you see in the orchard are the hybrid parents. Their offspring end up in the Arbor Day Nursery run by Adam Howard. We have three crops per year that we grow and we produce about, we can produce up to 50,000 hazelnuts in each crop. We're trying to find that funny plant out there that was a ma and pa that just was a superstar. A superstar that could make us think of nuts in a whole new way. Why is the hazelnut project important? You know, um, as we look at the world and we look at the energy savings that need to be, when we look at the major things of water, this will, will make water cleaner for watersheds. This will sequest carbon, so it keeps carbon from going into the atmosphere. So from environmental sustainability to biofuel and the food we eat, researchers encourage budding scientists to take note. Young people that are interested in, in making a difference, this is a, one area that when we could really make a difference. This could become the third crop for the United States in terms of the Midwest. It could be corn, soybeans, and hazelnuts. Something to chew on as the hazelnut comes into its own. Up next, greening up your city. That's the subject of the film from the winner of the recent Planet Connect teen video contest. Don't go away. More Eco Company is next. And 20. What could your city do to green things up? That was exactly the question posed to students who entered Planet Connect's teen video contest. Entrants had to provide the answer using science, technology, engineering, and math. That's exactly what Laura Sanchez did in her winning film, Miami, A Green Paradise. Located on the Atlantic coast of Florida, Miami Beach is known for being an international recreation destination. However, a statistic showed that each person in Miami generates an average of four pounds of garbage per day and uses 150 gallons of water daily. Cars also release dangerous gases into the air, such as carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. The percentage of these gases in the atmosphere is about 380 parts per million. So how can we make our city more sustainable? By using more solar energy, fewer power plants that produce greenhouse gases would need to be built. 
Instead of using your car, you can take the metro, a bus, or ride a bike. Every time you cycle instead of driving, you significantly reduce emissions of toxic waste. Another initiative that the city is undertaking is improving the energy efficiency and the water efficiency of the city's buildings and facilities. Uh, for example, um, throughout the city's uh, city hall and um, other buildings, we're installing um, new lighting fixtures, we're adjusting the air conditioning in order to be more energy efficient. In terms of sun energy, wind energy, there's so much to do, it's just a matter of uh, doing it. I think we have the technology nowadays to make the uh, recycling process even better and more efficient if we just wanted to. The community of Miami Beach has also shown how much they care about their city and the importance of helping our community become greener. So what are you doing for your city? Start today. Let's create a better place for our future generations. That wraps it up for us this week on Eco Company. Thanks for tuning in. To view segments from our show or to send us your feedback, head to our website at eco-company.tv. And get out and enjoy nature. And remember that you too can be a part of the solution. We'll see you back here next time on Eco Company. Eco Company.